Welcome back to World War Two TV. Did you miss me? I've been gone all, all of 55 minutes. Uh, anyway, as we continue our specific week, Chris Hemler is here on World War Two TV to share research from his super book, Delivering Destru Destruction, which I'm holding a copy of there, uh, about fire support, naval fire support, amphibious doctrine, etc., etc., etc. The link to purchase his book is in the description below. I urge you to go out there and support all these new up-and-coming historians. So um, welcome, Chris. How are you today? I'm great, Paul. How, how are you? I'm good. So uh, with new guests like yourself, I'd like at the beginning to just ask you to kind of introduce yourself, former Marine, but how did you come at looking at this kind of amphibious doctrine and, and the lessons learned? So a little bit about yourself first. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. But let me first thank you for having me on the show. I mentioned in the, you know, before we were hopping on that I feel like an imposter. I don't know how I snuck into your, your great lineup when you bring in Richard Frank and Ian Toll and Craig Simon. So great to be with your gang and look forward to our conversation today. I spent 10 years on active duty in the U.S. Marine Corps, and, and my initial occupational specialty was an air support control officer. Uh, and so I don't have combat experience, but even in the training scenarios and exercises I've participated in, um, I gained a, a personal appreciation for the complexity of these operations, uh, and particularly integrating different weapons uh, on a battlefield. And so uh, it, it became a part of my story. Uh, as I as I became a scholar later in my career, and then it made these kinds of topics absolutely fascinating to me. Well, brilliant stuff. And I say it's been a bit of a recurring theme uh, in recent months that the Pacific campaign isn't just all these random events happening. There is sort of method in the madness and lessons are being learned. And you can see this um, change in attitude, change in approach as the campaign goes on. And it's it's good that we're looking at it that way now, because I was just saying to you before you went live, folks, is that I think in the past there are books about Iwo Jima, there are books about Tara, there are books about whatever, uh, New Guinea. And it's it's nice to see now that people are kind of connecting the dots and saying, okay, this is what they were doing wrong here and how they corrected it or partially corrected it by here and so on and so forth. But folks, Chris has come armed with a PowerPoint um, we're going to probably do the presentation kind of in one go, unless there are particular questions relating to what's on screen. But kind of the bigger questions about doctrine and uh, did the Marines or the Army get it better in the Pacific or did the Navy get better than the uh, Army Air or whatever? We'll do those kind of ones at the end. But I'm going to hand over to Chris now to take us through this presentation. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I want to begin. Uh, let me first offer a, a word on vocabulary. I'm going to use a word today. Uh, that, that might strike your viewers as foreign, uh, the word's trifibious. Uh, and what I mean in using that word, I use it throughout the book, uh, Delivering Destruction. I really want to emphasize the land, sea, and air components of these operations. By the way, Winston Churchill, the great orator, used the word in a speech during the war. Uh, and so I feel I've got good grounding there, but it's not a phrase we used often. We tend to refer to trifibious operations with the more familiar amphibious, land yeah. and sea. Uh, and so I'll use that that uh, that nuance on purpose here today uh, because I really really want to introduce that layer of complexity uh, and and uh, and and even three warfare communities coming together to pursue a single objective. Uh, so I want to flag that for the viewers from the outset. Let's go on uh, to to my opening image here, uh, Paul. Your viewers will will be very familiar with this picture atop Mount Suribachi, taken on the twenty third of February. 1945. The Marines had crested the hill and raised the American ensign over the battlefield below. Uh, this is a wonderful image, uh, and it led to, it became a symbol of the Marines' courage, their resolve, uh, their grit, and their performance in the Pacific. But what I think this image also did was shift the narrative to, to a, a hyper-focus on the riflemen, uh, on the grit of the Marines on the beach, and kind of a John Wayne narrative of sorts, that, that, that really this courageous rifleman won the war outright. I don't mean to discredit that storyline at all. What I do mean to suggest, though, in the book is that there were a range of specialists uh, behind that rifleman that supported victory in the Pacific, and they were very, very important to the development efforts, the learning that took place across, across the Central Pacific Campaign. And the Marine infantrymen could not have done what they did without the fire support that first got them ashore and then sustained their attack. And that fire support came from both naval gunfire ships and air support overhead. On D-Day alone, to give us a, a point of reference, American ships fired 1906 16-inch shells, 1,514-inch shells, and 30,000 5-inch shells. 
That's D-Day alone. Uh, mm -hmm. That support, again, fueled the Marines' advance, got them ashore, and allowed them to take a picture like this. So without discrediting uh, the grunt at all, I think it's important to step back and recognize the fire support specialists that also played an essential role in victory. The Marine advance was dependent on this fire support. We'll hop along here and, and share a quick map of the battles that we'll cover. Uh, Paul, you've had some wonderful guests on. You had a marshal, a, a specialist on the Marshall's campaign the other day. Uh, so I'm glad that I'm not repeating too much context there. We're going to look at three battles today that help capture the lesson learning uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the adaptation of the 5th Amphibious Corps. Uh, those three battles will be Tarawa, Saipan, and Iwo Jima, shown here on our screen. Most of the viewers will be familiar generally with those. And of course, we won't be able to click into every detail of those battles, but I want to emphasize the lessons and the experiences uh, that taught the 5th Amphibious Corps uh, and, and helped refine its model of fire support before uh, that, that assault on Iwo Jima. Any good story about the Marines in World War II has to start in the interwar period. And, and, and I show here uh, what's called the tentative manual for landing operations. There's a, a picture of a draft manual here on the screen. This was completed in 1934 as the Marines were beginning to think about this problem or really had been thinking about this problem for some time. That is war with Japan and the Pacific. They were following the Navy's lead for War Plan Orange and wondering how they might attack enemy held islands and get their Marines ash ashore. This manual is completed in 1934, uh, almost a decade before the war. It's later adopted by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army, which is a testament to the authors and the work, the good work, uh, doctrinal work that they did here. But the manual focused a lot on command relationships, naval gunfire firing techniques logistics, casualty evacuations, things like this. It had a very introverted emphasis, right? It, it took a kind of siloed approach to trifibious operations. And I think it underemphasized or underappreciated the complexity and interdependence of these operations. And so it didn't fully address uh, the challenge of first landing and then sustaining uh, combat power ashore. The manual talked about mutual understanding and it mentioned close cooperation, but it didn't really dive into those topics with the depth that the Marines would appreciate early in the war. As one uh, reference point, the authors dedicated 11 pages to topics of ship firing positions, targeting techniques, and ammunition characteristics, but they gave just two pages to discussion on fire control parties and the coordination of naval gunfire between the Marines on the beach and the gunners off offshore. So again, I'm, I'm suggesting that the balance of the doctrine, uh, or, or the doctrine rather, was a bit imbalanced. Mm -hmm. uh, Just a quick question for you, Chris. Um, sure. From being devil's advocate, in mid 1934, the people who drafted this book, though, could have not possibly imagined the amount of firepower that would have been avail available to the American military ten years later. You know that. The the the, fit, the facts and figures are absolutely astonishing. It's like when you know the the the, the reports written about the potential use of strategic bombing in the mid nineteen thirties. They had no idea that a thousand four engine heavy bombers could be a, a possible thing. So is part of this just the clear um, lack of real lack of not vision because they obviously have vision, but lack of just on the understanding of just how big the American military was going to become. I think it's a very fair point, right? And 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 we always want to keep that in mind because uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? And we 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 want, we want to be empathetic toward the actors at the time. Um, I would suggest that the the Navy's fleet landing exercises of the nineteen thirties should have solved more of that than right. they did, right? They were putting these concepts into action, but yet again, even in the flexes, they were often training in an isolated fashion where naval gunfire ships were training on a, on a particular island and Marines were landing on a separate island. And so the challenge was bringing all of that together. And I do believe that, that professionals of the time might have made more progress than they did, not perfected it uh, by any means, but made more progress than they did during that interwar period. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. So let's, let's hop along here. Um, to our next slide and talk about Tarawa. This is really the first true test uh, for the 5th Amphibious Corps and for the Marines. Uh, this is Basio Island. You'll see that the airfield dominates almost the entirety of the island. Basio is the main objective of the Tarawa assault in the Gilbert's chain. 
And this is really a stronghold. There's no doubt about it. Rear Admiral uh, Mechi Shibasaki is the ranking Japanese commander. And by the time the Marines attack, he's constructed more than 500 concrete bunkers and a frightening web of mines, machine gun positions, barbed wire, on and on. Uh, Shibasaki famously boasted that a million Americans couldn't take Tarawa in 100 years. Uh, he would be proven wrong, but he had good reason to be confident going into the battle. He had prepared quite a fortress, uh, and the Americans were to learn uh, many lessons here in their attack on Basio. We'll talk about Tarawa being a costly victory. The Marines attack on the 20th of November, 1943, and they do ultimately secure the island, but it comes at great, great cost. Uh, Robert Sherrod, a wartime correspondent riding ashore with the Marines, thought that the preliminary bombardment, just a three-hour naval bombardment, would have killed all the Japanese that there were on the island. He wrote, surely we all thought no mortal men could live through this destroying power. The Marines riding ashore are confident that the naval guns have done the job. Another Marine re remarks, I read about this in the book, that he thought the Navy was going to ship them ice cream when they got to the beach because there wouldn't be any defenders left. And yet Shibasaki's detachment or the majority of it does survive that initial barrage and they're prepared to fight and resist the Marines at the beach. Here's what goes wrong uh, for the Marines. It splinters into chaos rather quickly. Shortly after that pre-landing naval bombardment ended, uh, the Americans had a number of things uh, kind of uh, run off the spool. Several of the transport vessels anchored in the wrong location, and this, this precluded the landing craft from finding the right waves and organizing their approach to the beach. The airstrike came 30 minutes late because the ranking task force commander, the naval task force commander, had ordered a delay on account of a strong headwind and the problems with the reef. We've talked about the coral reef at Tarawa and how it uh, how it precluded the LCVPs, the Higgins boats, from getting into the beach. It forced the Marines to shuttle those supplies and troops to amphibian tractors, a very limited supply of amphibian tractors, and it slowed down their assault. Uh, so very quickly, the American attack is, is uh, bordering on mayhem. They don't have enough water over the reef. They've lost many communications. Uh, the USS Maryland, one of the battleships, has lost its radios uh, for a period of time in the morning, actually because of its own, uh, the shock from its own guns. And so the attack is delayed and now disorganized. The aircraft squadrons are on a tight timeline. They fail to adjust and they arrive late to the scene. Put simply, the different components of the American task force didn't harmonize their actions. They failed to achieve their collective potential because of a number of understandable, uh, difficult uh, conditions. Here's what I would call out in particular, three evident failures in the American fire support at Tarawa. I've already mentioned the coordination problem. The Americans had committed themselves to a prearranged timeline that didn't allow them to adjust on the fly and remain flexible as they attacked the beach. Second, in compounding those problems, the Fifth Corps found that its communications gear was, was tragically unsuited for the affair. Many of them, the radios were damaged uh, by water when they were getting ashore. Many of them were too bulky to set up. The Marines couldn't get them together and, and raise their radio nets when they got to the beach. And so they were too bulky for, for safe and efficient operation under fire. Third and finally, I think the Fifth Corps lacked a, a, a common culture to understand the challenges at each corner of the battlefield. And we'll talk more about culture in a minute because I think it's a, it's a central ingredient both in the early challenges and the eventual success of the Navy and Marine Corps in the Central Pacific. But ultimately, it's a victory. Uh, the Marines had to cut their teeth somewhere. Tarawa was a, a proof of concept. It proved the Americans could take a heavily defended beach, and yet it came at great cost and it forced the American people to wonder what will this entire war cost our nation? 3,400 casualties for uh, Basio Island, less than one square mile in size. Uh, 1,100 of those 3,400 are dead, uh, and Americans are some are, are understandably concerned with the future of this conflict. It's really the Americans' response to the trauma of Tarawa that proves decisive in the succeeding campaigns, and we'll get into that in just a minute. I want to share this image. Here's a battle damage uh, photograph from the American naval bombardment. And I think this suggests, as I shared uh, the quote with you, that many Marines felt very confident getting to the beach because this is what their naval bombardment had done. 
and yet on account of Japanese defensive positions and on account of the Navy using an area fire technique over a precise targeting technique, it led to a, a high survival rate within Shibasaki's detachment. I share this next photograph, not because it's relevant to my topic, but because I think it's important. I put it in the book. Here's a Marine sharing water with a kitten underneath a damaged Japanese tank. And I just think it's important as we talk about these things, uh, the, the most destructive conflict in human history, that we pack our humanity along the way. These are humans dealing with, with unimaginable circumstances, harrowing conditions, uh, both for American uh, Marines and sailors and for Japanese defenders. I mean, these are trying, trying conditions. And this photograph uh, taken on Beishio Island I, I spoke to me as, as I was doing my research and kind of reminded me of that, of that uh, human element that's so important when we talk about the statistics, Paul, to your point earlier, yeah. these absolutely astonishing statistics, whether in naval shells or rifle rounds or, or casualties, uh, deaths, unfortunately, uh, we can lose sight of, of that human narrative. And so I add that image in. Just a quick question for you, Atti, maybe two. So David Levine is saying, uh, does Chris think that the intelligence about the Japanese positions was poor prior to the bombardment? I think the intelligence was decent. Uh, the Marines knew what they were getting into. The coral reef uh, was certainly a problem they didn't expect. There was a strange neap tide on that day. Most of their intelligence, they had they had a few uh, a few alarmists worried about that reef, but for the most part, they believed they'd be fine. In terms of the Japanese positions, they had uh, strong photographic evidence of what was going on. And yet again, I think their confidence was just a bit too high. They believed that their naval barrage their preliminary airstrikes uh, would give them the advantage they needed. Was there another one, Paul? Can, can we can we hop along? No, that's fine. I think you've done it. Yep, no, good. Great. Okay, let's move on to kind of the, the, the meat of the story here, the wartime progress of, of fire coordination teams in the Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, in late 1943, the Americans will begin changing quite a few things. The first thing they'll do is establish a naval gunfire training section in Hawaii to begin training uh, ship crews as they come out to the Pacific. This school will be focused on naval gunnery, communications, and cross-unit cooperation. And you can see kind of that cultural flavor uh, that they're beginning to tie into the problem here, the operational problem in the Pacific. The Naval Gunfire Training School really became a nerve center of wartime adaptation for the remainder of the war. The Fifth Corps would cycle back combat veterans from the front lines to Hawaii to train the incoming replacements, essentially training their own replacements that would go on to control and coordinate firepower uh, in the Marshalls and the Marianas uh, and onward. Uh, eventually, that Naval Gunfire Training School will train, certify more than 800 ships heading out to the Central Pacific, which, which is certainly an impressive accomplishment. The second thing they do is they develop what's known as a Joint Assault Signal Company, a JASCO in the acronym. Uh, this company will be principally responsible for the rest of the war for managing the coordination of both air support and naval gunfire. Uh, that was a new concept. Of course, the Marine Corps had an air liaison party that was responsible for talking to aircraft pilots in action. And it had a surefire control party, but it hadn't integrated those teams and it hadn't begun to see them as, as a single unit, unit, excuse me, capable of bringing all that together uh, again to achieve a single objective. Uh, and so that was a very important step forward. And the JASCOs are a big part of this story uh, moving on. It allowed them to share information more freely within the landing force. It allowed them to communicate their progress tactically and refine objectives and targets uh, as they were moving ashore. By 1944, the JASCOs are leading shipboard conferences in preparation for future operations. They're actually bringing representatives of the landing force off of their training islands. They're taking them out to the ships. They're putting them in the command centers and, and putting them face to face with naval gunfire representatives and carrier squadron representatives. And so here we see people coming together. I mean, it, be, it becomes a people business, right? Where these humans have to get together, appreciate one another's perspective and improve their techniques. This allows the JASCOs to prioritize requests more efficiently in combat. It allows them to curb redundancy uh, between fire missions. Perhaps when a pilot uh, and artillery 
battalion are focusing on the same uh, target, that can be uh, either emphasized if necessary or precluded if it's redundant. And so those JASCOs, again, become a, a, a real agent of change within the 5th Amphibious Corps. They also improve that singular purpose and that cultural feel. I think it's important here to call out the cultural differences between, in particular, the aviation elements and the ground elements. Naval pilots from their earliest days in training have been taught to rely on timelines and prescriptions and finite amounts of fuel. You're very concerned with that if, if you're a pilot in the air. And yet on the ground side, the infantry units are taught to emphasize flexibility, uh, agility, and responsiveness on the battlefield. Both of those cultures were established for good reason, and yet to function well together, uh, someone had to bring those perspectives, uh, share those perspectives across the task force. And that's really what the JASCOs begin to do. Naval gunfire would be yet a third culture somewhere, I think, between those two. But it's an important point, that, that a point of friction that had to be addressed. We'll talk about uh, the, those final points there when we get to Iwo Jima. We'll talk about some of the innovation and adaptation that's happening uh, across the Central Pacific. The Fifth Corps will introduce what's called what, what it calls a rolling naval barrage, and they'll also emphasize uh, proximate aviation command and control from the beach, which will be a brand new concept in 1945. Again, we'll save that for our discussion on Iwo Jima. Next is the Battle of Saipan. Um, the American capture of the Marianas in 1945 is often recognized as the decisive operation of the Pacific War. Uh, it, it really breaks the back of the Japanese defenders. Ian Toll put it this way. He said, uh, quote, it was the final and irreversible blow to the hopes of the Japanese imperial project. Victory on Saipan brought the resignation of uh, Prime Minister Tojo Hideki, as well as his entire cabinet, and it finally put B-29s within striking range of Tokyo. It also established a forward U.S. naval base in the Marianas. The Marines will attack Saipan with three divisions, the 2nd and 4th, you see pictured there on the western side of the island, and the 27th uh, Infantry Division, an army outfit, attacking from the south. Uh, within a few days, they're able to capture Esleto Airfield, uh, one of three airfields that are either completed or under construction, on the island. And as we know, uh, the Pacific War is very much a struggle for airfields uh, across the entire theater. Uh, and so that's true again here at Saipan. As at Tarawa, the first 24 hours are horrific for the Marines, but they are able to, to gain momentum. Uh, they're able to get some more firepower ashore and under the back or, or on the back of naval gunfire and aviation support, they're able to slog their way across the island. The dense uh, interior of Saipan presents its own challenges and Japanese snipers are incredibly effective uh, in the sugarcane, uh, particularly in the, the rugged interior of the island. To emphasize the fire support, um, you know, the fire support efforts on Saipan were nothing short of staggering. I think these figures will capture that for you. More than 138,000 rounds fired during the operation, more than 17 million pounds of naval ordnance. Battleships Tennessee and Colorado each expended more than 1.2 million pounds of naval munitions during the operation. And at the peak of on-call fire support, that's fire support being called to the island, right, in real time as the Marines are advancing. At the peak of that support, there are 40 naval gunfire officers and 27 shore fire control parties ashore on Saipan. There's a total of 66 American warships delivering fire that includes 13 battleships, nine cruisers, and, and uh, most of the remainder American destroyers. The Iowa-class battleships are now in the fight in the Pacific. They've arrived to the theater. They've got a 16-inch naval gun on board. And I always like to point out that a single 16-inch projectile weighs the same as a small passenger car, uh, about 2,500 pounds. So this is, uh, again, just an incredible... Uh, amount of ordnance and firepower applied to these objectives. And reminding ourselves again that that's just the offensive part of these these ships. These ships also need food for the crews, fuel, and everything else that goes with it again. And we, we can't say it enough on this channel how the logistics is absolutely essential to the Pacific campaign. And as you you made the point, you know, about the photo in Iwo Jima, the 
the Marines are often seen as the point of the spear, but the, and the spear isn't a very good analogy because a spear is thin going backward. This is a big extending triangle of support going back behind there, and it's just staggering, staggering information. But a quick question from Stephen about um, you may or may not know the answer to what about the, would be the lifespan of a 16 inch gun on a naval ship at that time? Oh, wow, I, Stephen, that, that's a great question. I regret that I don't have an answer. Uh, man, I, I would love to dig into that, and I'm going to make it a point to, to try to find the right It, it is a great question. And I, I would, I'm not surprised you don't know, but I mean, that they, they do, I'm sure there, there is a limited, I mean, machine there's got to be, and, and yet yeah. I, I hazard to take a guess, uh, but it's a great question. We'll come back to that. We'll circle back to that, as the young folks say, folks. That's we'll, right. We'll, That's we'll come right. back to that in a future show. And Woody, on your comment, it's worth mentioning, remember, this is June of 1944, as you point out the logistics. Uh, this is D-Day in the Pacific, and yet there's a D-Day, another D-Day that you're, you're quite familiar with happening in Normandy as the Americans and the Allies cross the English Channel. And so, again, it's, it's a reminder of, of the logistics required in both theaters and the incredible industrial production an industrial complex that contributes to to projecting American power uh, literally around the globe. Brilliant. Thanks. Let's move on here. I want to point out a few things as it relates to fire support on Saipan. There's three things in particular that the Americans really improve. That's proximity, communications, and trust. And Saipan is really a critical turning point in the Marines' uh, adaptation, again, around fire control and coordination in the war. The 5th Corps headquarters had developed an informal technique to physically co-locate its senior artillery, air, and naval gunfire representatives at a command post, a single command post, ashore on Saipan. This is a really important step. They hadn't dictated that kind of relationship before, but all of a sudden you have these senior representatives, again overseeing land, sea, and air firepower next to each other, able to flatten their communication channels, share their concerns, limit redundancy, and focus their individual weapons on the best task at hand. This improved common awareness around the landing force and each of the divisions ashore uh, and really contributed to more efficient operations. The, the radio frequencies got much better uh, in the Marianas. Uh, the fire, fire coordination specialists learned to use a common frequency during simultaneous attacks where you could begin to put a pilot uh, an artillery uh, spotter, uh, even a naval gunfire spotter, all in the same network so that they could coordinate their effects again in real time as the battle is happening. On Saipan, this allows those shorefire control parties to bring fire as close as 50 yards to the front line of the marine elements, which again, given the size of this naval ordinance, is a very, very close range. And, and I would, I would uh, suggest, uh, you know, out of the doctrinal tolerance uh, for friendly fire, but it was very, very effective as the Marines advanced across the island. Finally, as we've spoken to, the trust improves considerably. The relational trust within the elements of the Fifth Corps uh, really began to take off in the Marianas. And this is because of the impact of the JASCOs, the refined training procedures, the shipboard conferences, and the Corps really learned to, learning to fight as a cohesive team. An appreciation again for the trifidious uh, synchronization required to make these operations effective. Here's our final battle that we'll talk about today, and it's it's uh, arguably the most important, uh, Iwo Jima. Here's Lieutenant General Tadamichi Kurabayashi, the Japanese commander of Iwo Jima. He's been hand selected uh, to lead this effort, this defense of uh, uh, this defense in the Bonin Island chain. Kurabayashi is aware of his fate. He knows that this is a death mission and that his task is to bleed the Americans uh, as much as he can, to make this as costly of an operation as he possibly can. Uh, Kurabayashi quickly sets to work when he lands on Iwo Jima. Uh, by the time the Americans attack, he's got 642 concrete pillboxes with walls ranging from three to five feet in thickness. He's got 120 large naval guns, 300 anti-aircraft guns, 130 howitzers, and 70 rocket launchers, to say nothing of his mortars, his anti-tank weapons, and his small arms, uh, light, and heavy, light and heavy machine guns scattered throughout the detachment. Ammunition was in abundant supply. He has uh, more than 22 million rounds for small arms on the island of Iwo Jima. 
as another point of reference for uh, the battle that is about to begin, Kurobayashi's command post is 75 feet below the surface. And the Japanese have done uh, a, an outstanding job at digging their, uh, their cave networks into the island. The island poses its own environmental uh, challenges to the Marines. The landing beaches are, are uh, filled with steep gradients and soft black volcanic ash, which will make it difficult for vehicles, even tracked vehicles, uh, to get ashore and make it even more difficult for infantrymen to make their way uh, on foot throughout the island. As a testament to how far naval gunfire had advanced and, and, and how important it was to these operations, the Marines will conduct three, or excuse me, the Navy will conduct three days of preliminary shelling on Iwo Jima. Uh, compare that to just three hours at Tarawa when Sherrod and, and his fellow uh, or his, uh, his Marines thought that uh, that three hours would be enough. The battleships came in much closer on Iwo Jima, some creeping as close as 2,000, even 1,000 yards offshore in order to improve their effectiveness and their precision firing. Really, the audacious part of the plan here comes from a man by the name of Donald Weller. Weller had been the 5th Corps' naval gunfire officer for the majority of the Central Pacific Campaign. He had actually stood up the Naval Gunfire Training School in Hawaii back in 1943. And Weller comes up with an idea to conduct a rolling naval barrage where the naval guns will creep their fire in front of the Marine infantry in one and 200 yard increments. As the Marines advance, they'll nudge that curtain of fire forward and walk it on to the Japanese positions behind the beach. This of course is risky. It, it, it re requires close cooperation between the frontline Marines and the Naval gunfire coordinators. And of course it does, if it works, provide, provides the best coverage to the Marines during the most vulnerable stage in their attack, which is that transition from the landing craft uh, to the beach. Weller, uh, Weller believed that, that, that this would make the most, uh, you know, of course, create the best conditions uh, for the Fifth Corps as it landed. And he, he declared his intention to, quote, wring the last ounce of potential from the naval gun. Uh, Weller was a firm believer in the power of naval gunfire. He'd spent his career, uh, he graduated from the Naval Academy and spent his career on a number of naval ships and then served ashore as an artilleryman. Uh, and so he had a real appreciation uh, for fire support. So this was a very effective uh, aspect of the Marines attack on Iwo Jima and went off uh, really without a hitch to the, to the credit of the JASCOs and the control agencies that coordinated this rolling naval barrage. The Marines weren't just uh, adapting their naval gunfire techniques, they were also taking a new look at air support. And this officer, uh, Colonel Vernon McGee, would be the first to take ashore uh, a, a, an air control element to direct aircraft from the beach. We've got a really, uh, we've got a mouthful of an acronym there for you on the first line. This is an, uh, a landing force air support control unit. Uh, that's what McGee leads. And he'll take it ashore uh, on the first day of March, about a week and a half into the battle. And he'll, he will assume authority for directing all air support operations in support of ground troops on Iwo Jima. Up until this point, control of aircraft, meaning the authority to direct an aircraft, had resided with Navy representatives out at sea at the command centers afloat. McGee was a believer that you had to get that control ashore to make it more responsive and to, to tune it to the, the conditions of the landing force on the ground. Uh, McGee's, got, McGee's got a great quote that I include in the book. He said that control can't reside out on some ship, is how he put it. He really believed it had to come forward with the Marines to strengthen that bond and flexibility in battle. So Marine, uh, excuse me, McGee brings that support ashore. It really improves the responsiveness and the communications of the controllers ashore, and it gets Marines the most effective air support that they've received to date in the Pacific. He's got a heavy footprint. It takes him 17 officers and 56 enlisted technicians to pull this off. Uh, but it is a, a revolutionary step forward. And in, in, in fact, is a, 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 an idea alive in the Marine Corps uh, today with a, a number of different agencies, uh, command and control agencies that have splintered off from this idea of, of uh, control ashore. 
McGee institutes a brand new briefing procedure for the pilots supporting the troops on the ground. He requires them to come over the radio and report the target coordinates that they're headed to, their attack timeline, their heading, and their minimum strike altitude. This allow, allows McGee's and his men to share that information with artillery representatives, as well as naval gunfire representatives, again, in the spirit of, of making this fire support more efficient holistically around the core. In fact, McGee's uh, Landing Force Air Support Control Unit troops uh, had the authority to order a ceasefire when necessary because they had access to this kind of comprehensive information of the attacks that were underway. The final thing McGee, uh, the final uh, you know, revolutionary component that McGee contributes is, is something they, they dub Plan Victor during the operation on Iwo Jima. This plan, when called into effect, stipulated that mortar, artillery, and rocket units that were firing within a Japanese position uh, within 2,500 yards of an aircraft target, they had to keep their ordnance below 1,100 feet. And what this did was it provided a, a cushion for the, the, the pilots to conduct operations freely. It gave an artificial ceiling to those land units, uh, and it allowed, a, a, again, a greater synchronization of, uh, of parallel fires uh, ashore at Iwo Jima. To show the effectiveness of the Marines' combined arms at Iwo Jima, I think General Kurobayashi might be our best source. Uh, Kurobayashi is killed in the battle, of course, but, uh, but through one of his surviving staff officers, we have this quote uh, from March. I don't have a particular date for it, but it's from March of 1945. And Kurobayashi wrote, I am not afraid of the fighting power of only three American Marine divisions if there are no bombardments from aircraft and warships. This is the only reason why we have to see such a miserable situation. Here's a great photograph. Again, I regret I don't have a date stamp uh, for it, but a great photograph, a division of F-6F Hellcats attacking Japanese targets on the island of Iwo Jima. Here's another great image that I think suggests uh, just how tough these targets were. This is a reinforced bunker built into the side of a hill on Iwo Jima, and here's a Marine patrol about to clear that bunker. So lest we forget, the fire support is absolutely essential to the Marines' advance in the Central Pacific, and yet it takes that Marine infantry unit. Uh, they must uh, get themselves ashore, clear the island, and they have the thankless task of, of clearing hardened bunkers like this, searching for Japanese survivors uh, and, and, and really finalizing the security of the island. All right, here's, here's where we'll, we'll maybe try to wrap things up. Um, I've got a wonderful quote here that, that, that really just, I think, speaks to the story of the 5th Amphibious Corps, a quote from historian Jonathan House. He writes that individual weapons, however powerful, do not win wars. And I think that really gets to the heart of the synergy of trifibious operations in the Central Pacific and this combination of fire support that was required to be successful from Tarawa to Iwo Jima. I want to suggest a, a, a few conclusions or, or, or thoughts that I think my study draws out. The first is that this is a lesson in organizational culture and bottom-up adaptation. Uh, the Fifth Corps is interested in ideas from anywhere especially on the front lines. And there's a number of young officers. Lieutenant Charles Corbin is a, Na a Navy lieutenant uh, that contributes to many of these solutions, and he appears throughout the book. Uh, but the, the Marines and the Navy are really interested in solutions from anywhere, and they, they emphasize a learning culture uh, throughout the, the campaign. Many of their after-action reports run over a 1,000 pages, and so we know that they're, that they're participating in deliberate committed staff work to really capture the lessons from each battle and carry them forward uh, to the next objective. The next thing that I think the Fifth Corps really gets right is the human element uh, of warfare. I think there's still an idea alive in the scholarship and in the popular understanding of World War II that the Americans and the Allies, that their technological advantage and their sheer industrial might led to victory. And I'm not here to overturn those ingredients. They're very important to allied success in the war. But I am here to suggest, in fact, I'm convinced 
that those weapons required fundamentally human solutions. Uh, fire coordination in the Pacific was an art. It was not a science. And it required that human perspective, uh, a deep and, and cultural understanding of what's happening on the ground, breaking down perspectives and sharing awareness across this team. Combat is a deeply interactive and dynamic process, and it's not enough to just arrive with the best weapon. I think the Fifth Corps recognized that, its leaders recognized that, and they were able, uh, they were the better for it. Structure is important as well. I mentioned the organizational culture and the bottom-up adaptation, but the staff structure was essential. Again, the after-action reports often running over a thousand pages. In the case of Iwo Jima, 1,700 pages of after-action material uh, for the Fifth Amphibious Corps, and there's there's just excellent um, staff work being done throughout the campaign. Uh, and finally, collaboration and trust. Uh, there's a great quote by, by uh, you know, a thought leader today. He's the founder of the Optimism uh, Company and, uh, and, uh, and a thought leader um, and, and an author, Simon Sinek. He says that trust is the lubrication of an organization. And I think that really speaks to the Fifth Corps' experience. They had to establish that trust across boundaries and across warfare communities. And until they broke down those boundaries, they couldn't have achieved uh, what they did in places like Iwo Jima. Um, that's all I've got, Paul. I'm happy to, to, uh, take some questions or, or engage in some, some discussion. Well, both, um, it's been brilliant. Thank you very much. And folks, again, remind you the book, there is a link in the description, but you can buy it at your favorite bookstore. I'll hold up my copy there. Um, so my first, it's sort of a comment rather than a question as a, as a Normandy guy, I feel that in Normandy, we had to wait for the majority of the ground veterans to pass away before we could really present the idea of how important air power was and indeed naval support was. Because, and you know, you kind of alluded to this at the beginning, we told the stories from the kind of ground up. And, you know, you speak to an average infantryman in Normandy, American, British, or Canadian, and they'll say, there was never any air support. And you try and explain, no, but the air support was doing this. It was hitting railway lines 30 miles that way. It was hitting the, the, the troops coming up overnight. Do you think the same thing that kind of applies to the Pacific campaign is that while Marines and army guys were around talking about how bloody awful it was running up those beaches, it was difficult to kind of address that there was this infrastructure in place behind it because they themselves might not have perceived that. Yeah, it, it's a great comment, Paul. I think, um, I think my answer, I, I think they appreciated more than, than maybe veterans of the European theater did. Again, the, the importance of that aviation support and, and, and I'm not going to suggest that they were better humans uh, because of that. I mean, I think the geography is probably one of the main contributors, right? The Marines are fighting for, for small uh, yeah. islands and, 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 and atolls, and, and the aviation support is playing out in front of them, right? And so I think there's a little more separate, there, there's much more separation, frankly, in the European theater. And so I think proximity matters, but I also think, especially by Iwo Jima, uh, the Marines are convinced that they need that fire support to do what they're doing. Uh, they've, they've shared those lessons from 1943 forward and, uh, and, and there's a collective appreciation that, that, that I think is healthy. Okay. Well, we'll turn to some of the questions now and several of them are from Samuel Thompson. And so Samuel Thompson was a designated ACO responsible TLA. So he's got a kind of a, a vested interest in his subject. So we're gonna branch just, we're moving away from Iwo Jima and, and some of the places you've talked about. So I'll just kind of go through the questions there. So Samuel, sure. one of his questions is, uh, what was the typical command and control structure to coordinate joint army marine operations such as Okinawa? Uh, that's a good question. And it gets to the heart of, you know, the, the Navy, or, excuse me, the Marine and army rivalry that plays out, you know, especially between Saipan and Okinawa. Uh, but essentially the, um, the higher headquarters, in this case, the fifth Corps, was responsible for, uh, for the fire support coordination center that had emerged late in the war that was then uh, the, the senior agency responsible for this integration. And so I'm not a scholar of Okinawa, but I have to believe that that model went forward right. from Iwo Jima into the Okinawa campaign. Um, although of course there you have a ranking uh, army general in command, but you've got, um, you've got the same structure uh, now roles reversed uh, from say the Saipan arrangement where you've got an army division attached to a Marine higher headquarters. But in either case, the the uh, the agent the senior agency is going to re be responsible for integrating 
that fire control. Okay, thanks for that. And obviously, in terms of your book and your presentation, you focused on the three particular landings. But Sam was also asking, then we'll move on to other people's questions, any particular lessons from Peleliu that were useful at Iwo Jima? Yeah, um, I, I think an appreciation for the ability of the Japanese to dig in even more than they had to that point in the war. Uh, Peleliu is obviously a scathing experience for the Marines and a whole separate conversation about whether that operation was necessary uh, but it does inform, I think, the intensity of preparations for Iwo Jima because Peleliu is projected to be a short operation, yet it drags on for weeks and weeks. The other important lesson that would absolutely inform the Iwo Jima operation is the complete recognition that the Japanese are going to fight from their bunkers. Earlier in the war, the Japanese would, would generally conduct bonsai charges. This is happening at Guadalcanal. It's happening at Tarawa. They would spend their forces in a piecemeal fashion uh, in these spiritual bonsai charges that were very, very horrific uh, and, and concerning to the Marines, but they weren't tactically effective. Uh, they really wasted Japanese lives uh, and didn't do much to the Marine advance. Peleliu uh, establishes, uh, as Saipan had begun to indicate, that the Japanese are more interested in extracting lives. And to do that, they'll stay in their bunkers and they'll force the Marines to come and get them. Uh, that lesson will inform preparation for Iwo Jima, and that's exactly what the Marines will have to do there as well. Brilliant. Perfect answer to that one. Uh, one from Stephen this time. And we're going back to the rolling barrage uh, that you talked about. Were the ships at anchor for this stage or free-floating? And if so, how did they keep stationed? Yeah, so they would fire from established firing sections out at sea. And this was all part of those preliminary plans uh, that took place in the shipboard conferences and in the weeks leading up to an assault. But they would, been, been, they would have been given a firing uh, station several miles uh, wide, and they would, they would uh, sail back and forth within that firing station, right? So as to not uh, complicate other ships that are also firing, but they would stay within that station and they would sail back and forth while firing. Uh, brilliant. Uh, that's a great one. And uh, I'm just um, going to turn to something else now, uh, which is, where, where am I? And this is kind of a broader up this comes for both of us in some ways as the host of World War II TV. And Dennis is saying, it is my impression that not all of the lessons learned from the Pacific D-Day, such as the importance of pre-invasion bombardment, will fully incorporate into ETO landings. True. And my response to that is, yes, there wasn't enough cross-pollination. Uh, as you were talking earlier, Chris, and I'll let you give your answer in a minute. I was thinking that, you know, what you were saying about the Navy and the Marines coordinating, I was thinking about the... Um, the army, the air power used in the Mediterranean, for example, and the, and the mm -hmm. North Africa, and how what the army wanted the air power to do wasn't what the air power suggested it should do, and it took like months, if not years, there to kind of get that coordination. And yet, the same lessons in a different way are being learned, like on a separate rail line. Is these 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 developments are being made, but there's not much um, shifting across. Is that the, would you agree? I would agree with that answer. Uh, I would agree with that answer, unfortunately, right? We, we, we certainly wish there could have been more uh, information sharing between theaters. There's a couple things going on there. Uh, there there's, a, there's a parochialism, both yeah. within the Marine Corps and the Army. Um, you know, Eisenhower is, is somewhat dismissive of what the Marines are learning. And then the other point I would make is that, you know, the geographical differences are real. I made that point earlier in the talk. These are very, very different theaters. And I think so. So there is, uh, although it's not fair and we could have shared more lessons than than perhaps we did across the services. There is a recognition that that the European theater is just a, a very different world. And that's true. Yeah. Right. The Marines are attacking drastically different objectives. But it's not to say that there wasn't value in what they were learning. And, I'm, and again, I think to be defensive of the people involved in Collingwood and in the in the ETO and McNair and people you've talked about today is these are incredibly busy individuals who are busy enough trying to sort out their own theatre right. without kind of getting on the phone and saying, "Oh, hey, uh, uh, you you and the ETO, I've got some ideas I might want to put your way." And it, you know, it's e it's easier with the eighty years of hindsight to look at and, and see some of the the gaps in the communication. And, and I think that the other thing we often talk about in this channel is that the allies are at least learning. There may be a bit of a two steps forward, one step back, but the Germans, the Japanese, the Axis generally are not learning at all. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a sweeping generalization, but the allies, you can definitely see the graph is going up. 
I think sometimes mm. it kind of little bit dips on the way, but you you can see that the Allies are getting better and better at things, and I don't think you can apply that to the Axis. Uh, thankfully, I think really. Right. 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 So um, another one. This is kind of a uh, as Masters of the Air is 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 on there. We're going to mm. go and watch episode three either today or later. Um, Benjamin Allen is asking, could you discuss the accuracy or inaccuracy of Pacific War naval bombardments and amphibious assaults in movies and television shows? Uh, well, I, I, hole. <laughs> yeah, it, it, a bit of one, but it's a good question. I, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm not a movie critic and I'm sure there's too many that I haven't seen, but I do think the, you know, HBO's miniseries, the Pacific does a great job of capturing the drama, the chaos that's involved in some of these operations. It's a, it's a very intense film. It's, it's, you know, it's done in the, in the spirit of band of brothers, uh, for the Pacific theater. And so I think that's one that, that does a decent job. Uh, but certainly it's it's difficult to capture the true conditions uh, and, and, and and frankly, the chaos uh, that, that, that these scenes are. No, and I, and it comes back to what we were saying earlier about the way we have learned our history. And it, so much has been from the grunts point of view, the infantry and the, mm-hmm. uh, understandably, you know, we talk a lot about this channel, about the, the poor bloody infantry who are having to go across islands and mo- mountains in Italy. And but this idea of looking at it from this this different point of view of of the sinews of war behind is something I think it was being done just after war, but I think it's a real revolution we're seeing with historians now, such as yourself and Mm -hmm. sustaining the carrier war with Stan Fish we did a few weeks ago, Mm -hmm. that similar thing, looking about how the the carrier fleet are improving their systems of maintenance and recovery. And we could mm-hmm. talk about the ETU and ETO and the recovery of tanks and the triage system with armored vehicles. So, you know, th- th- there is this, there is a modern understanding, I think, of looking at the systems behind those guys running along at the front. But of course we are always going to be drawn to those guys running along with M1s and Lee Enfields who are, who are doing the actual killing. Um, right. Another couple of questions from Samuel Thompson there about, about Iwo Jima. Um, so Samuel is saying, what about those rocket-armed LSTs? Were they significant to Iwo Jima? And as a normally guy, the minute I hear rockets coming off landing craft, I think of them as being a very um, basically um, poor poor use. They were they were both basically a disaster in Normandy, but, but Iwo Jima. No, they, they were they were helpful. That, that's the word I'll use. Uh, they were helpful. I, I, I don't know that they were decisive, uh, but they were a nice complement. And they provided, a, a, of course, a closer range and a vessel that was much easier to maneuver uh, within these these much longer uh, firing trajectories. So um, they were helpful at Iwo Jima. And, and in fact, the Fifth Corps had been advancing that idea. They'd used it in the Marianas uh, in, in a lesser form. And so that was another component of, of naval fire support at Iwo Jima. Brilliant stuff. Well, my final question to you is: um, where next with your research? I mean, are, are you going to branch out to the to the ETO or the Mediterranean? Are you sticking yeah. with World War Two, Korea, Vietnam? Where where are you going? You're very you know, young. I, I don't know yet. I got to find. Uh, I've got to find a little more time in my day before I'm ready to bite off the next research project. But uh, you know, the Pacific War also in, will always have a fascination for me, and so uh, and, and uh, you know, to the great guests that you have on this show, Paul. Uh, you know, there, there's still a lot of work to be done and stories to uncover. Uh, and I should correct myself in, in honor of Richard Frank, right? The Asia Pacific War, uh, who you had yeah, on your last Yeah, indeed. Yeah, right? yeah. Language evolves. Yeah, that's right. right. And, and and it's a great it's a great reminder that that there's still work to be done and ways to think about this uh, that that uh, we still need to talk about. Well, and, and and we also need to address the fact that people that you reference, like Ian W. Toll, he's not writing about World War II anymore. He's writing about Revolutionary War or mm-hmm. something else. Uh, Rick Atkinson is not writing about World War II anymore. Um, Rich Frank still is, but others aren't. So we need people like yourself and Stan <laughs> Fisher and the other people coming on uh, to, to keep, take this work forward, put uh, kick the ball further down mm-hmm. the field because uh, th- these amazing historians have done incredible work, but th- there's there's more to be done. And I, mm-hmm. and I see that myself with the people who are contacting me saying, here's the angle I have been looking at. And um, it, there's, there's always more to learn. But Chris, um, good luck with the book. Um, I know it's been out a bit. Uh, folks, you know what to do. Go out there, get the book um, and tell it, tell it, share it with your friends. And folks, we've got one more show in this Pacific series, which is depending on where you are in the world, tomorrow morning or to, or it's later today if you're already Saturday, as the Australians and New Zealanders are, and I never get my uh, head around time uh, zones. But um, Peter Williams is coming on to talk about 
his incredible work interviewing Japanese veterans, which is something we don't really tend to think of. And as so we talked about the process of, of, of how um, it was to speak to them, were they uh, forthcoming? So that'd be a really good show. So that's 9 a.m. UK time tomorrow. No, 9.30 uh, UK time tomorrow or late at night if you're in the USA or later today yeah, for in Australia. I think I've got that right. So, Chris, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, thank you, very, everybody, for your fantastic questions. I will see you all in about whatever it is, 12 hours time. Cheers, everybody. Bye.